Good evening. Uh, welcome to AC Grayling for the Good of the World, presented by the Wheeler Centre. My name is Bhakti Puvanantharan. Um, I'm a journalist and editor, uh, and, and more importantly for you, I'm the host of what should be a really thought-provoking night on some chewy and urgent topics. I'm really looking forward to it, uh, and not least because this is my return to work after having a baby six months ago. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, see me after for photos. Um, no, but before we dive in, I would like to acknowledge that this event is taking place on the land of the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, including, uh, I'd like to note, I hope it's not too presumptuous, the late Uncle Jack Charles who passed this week and I think made an imprint on so many of us in this place. Tonight's event is supported by the Melbourne City Revitalisation Fund, a Victorian government and City of Melbourne partnership. It is also supported by Dumbo Feather, um, which we have copies of up the back as well. So there are free copies for you and there's an interview of AC Grayling in those. To get us started, I would like to welcome Nicholas Rees, the acting Lord Mayor of the City of Melbourne. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you very much, Bhakti. Um, good evening. Uh, I am Nicholas Rees, and for this week and next, I am the Acting Lord Mayor of Melbourne, and it is my great pleasure to be joining you here tonight for this address. Uh, can I also begin by acknowledging the traditional owners, Womanjinka, Marambik Burundap, Wurundjeri Willam U, Liwak U Kulin, Yalimbuba Yirumboi. The City of Melbourne respectfully acknowledges the traditional owners of the land we govern, the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung peoples of the Eastern Kulin, and pays our respect to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to acknowledge my fellow councillors who are here this evening. Great to see a good turnout, Councillor Jamal Hakim and Councillor Olivia Ball. Uh, wonderful to see you both. Uh, can I also uh, acknowledge the legendary Caro Llewellyn, who is with us this evening. Let's give it up for the CEO of the Willis Centre, Caro. And most importantly, can I welcome all of you. Wonderful to see so many familiar faces in the audience this evening. Well, for all of us, Anthony Clifford Grayling's call for a universal ethical outlook has great appeal. Finding common ground, ending division and conflict, safeguarding our planet, making our world fairer. What could be more compelling than addressing these questions? Now, as you've already heard, uh, I am a representative here at the, a local, a public representative uh, at the City of Melbourne. I often joke that there is no problem that is too small for a local councillor. <laughs> and even though sometimes the problems may seem small, there is a very serious side to that observation, and that it is that a lot of what we do in local government is dealing with small issues that have a huge impact on people's lives. And that's why the moral framework that is provided by people like Anthony is so helpful. So there at the City of Melbourne, when we find ourselves in a situation where the local public housing estates have been put into hard lockdown in part of the first response to COVID, it was the city that was coordinating food supplies uh, through the local community centre. Uh, when international students found that they could not work and were not entitled to any welfare, it was Town Hall that set up a voucher program that allowed them to get access to life's essentials. When the National Vaccination Program commenced, um, we set up a Vax Hub at Town Hall that allowed homeless people, uh, those without citizenship or fixed address, to get the jab. 
And so it's against the, a backdrop where we're making decisions like that, that uh, A.C. Grayling and his writings are so helpful. And I'm going to admit to being a very big fan. First, I love his belief in the notion that the philosopher should engage in public debate. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, we need philosophers to help uh, us navigate life's uh, thorny questions and set, help us set key directions. Second, his pursuit of the conversation about the possibility for good lives in good societies is something that I often reflect on in performing my duties as a local councillor. Everything we do is, at the end of the day, underpinned by a moral framework, declaring a climate and biodiversity emergency, supporting sustainable development, community services that we ask ourselves hard questions about as to whether they provide real help to our most vulnerable truth-telling and reconciliation with Aboriginal communities. All of these activities bear out a point that tonight's speaker, A.C. Grayling, makes emphatically. It is not too late. We must strive to the last moment for those who will inherit our world. The City of Melbourne supports events just like this one tonight. We're proud to be supporters of tonight's event because we know that thinkers and writers stimulate and energise us and help show us the way. So in conclusion, let me leave you with the words of a former Australian Prime Minister, who else but PJ Keating, and a nine-year-old child. I was struck by Paul Keating's reflections in the last week on the death of uh, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. His published remarks were as follows. In the 20th century, the self became privatised, while the public realm, the realm of the public good, was broadly neglected. Queen Elizabeth understood this and instinctively attached herself to the public good against what she recognised as a tidal wave of private interest and private reward. As for the child, the nine-year-old child, she wrote to The Guardian some years ago asking, why do we live? A big question. And it was A.C. Grayling who responded. He wrote, we live because there are people who love us and people we love back. We live because we want to find out things and learn. We live because we have hope. We live because we want to see what happens next. Who could put it better than tonight's speaker, the author of For the Good of the World? Please make A.C. Grayling very welcome. Thank you so much, everybody, and please enjoy the evening. Thanks. I do have a, a, a little bit more to say about our esteemed guests before uh, we just bring that applause right back up. So to the main event, AC Grayling, Anthony Clifford, as uh, you know, there's no mystery around what the initials stand for. Um, and he is one of the UK's most prominent, perhaps, let's just say it, the most prominent philosopher there. He is founder and principal of New College of the Humanities at Northeastern University and is its professor of philosophy too. He was for a number of years a columnist on The Guardian and The Times and Prospect magazine. He has contributed to many leading newspapers in the UK, the US and Australia and to BBC Radio, as well as being a regular television guest. He's also twice been a judge on the Booker Prize and has chaired the judging panel uh, as well for that prize. He has written and edited over 30 books. Isn't that a staggering number? Including the one that we are here tonight to discuss, his most uh, recent publication with Bloomsbury, For the Good of the World, a clarion call for human rights. Please make him welcome, Anthony Clifford Grayling. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much. Well, uh, alas, uh, the problems that we are going to uh, think about this evening are rather vexing ones. Um, usually, of course, it's uh, so much more cheerful to think about positive prospects facing the world. So uh, in considering what the big challenges are in our world today, we have to accept that there really are some, some serious uh, um, issues to address. There are quite a few, but I'm going to talk about three. The first of them is a very familiar one. It's the climate challenge. It's the fact that we are, in 2022, really lagging way behind the curve on dealing properly with this very serious emergency that the world faces. <clears throat> the world of human beings and present, presently existing species, I should say, because, of course, the planet itself would uh, survive even uh, a very serious rise in temperatures. It's done it before for various reasons, and it would, in millions of years' time, recover. If the planet is in a position to think about the matter at all itself, it will probably regard the disappearance of humanity anyway as a bit of a blessing. But from our point of view, um, we, we are uh, anxious about what will happen in the very near future because, as you've seen from the extreme weather events which have been happening more and more frequently and in more devastating ways in very recent times, this emergency is uh, approaching with increasing rapidity. And there's a great anxiety on the part of many people who are very knowledgeable about this in the scientific community that there could be trigger and cascade events uh, unpredictable. For example, if there were a massive release of methane gases from permafrost regions like Siberia, Canada, and the seabed, then the warming could become uh, even uh, more rap rapid. <clears throat> it's already, of course, in one sense too late to do anything about warming. Warming is going to happen. The effort to try to limit warming to below one point, uh, or, or below two at any rate, the target was 1.5 by mid-century, that's 1.5 degrees centigrade over pre-industrial levels. But uh, that target now looks very difficult to attain. At this very moment as we speak, it looks much more like 2.7 or 3 degrees, uh, and that of course is catastrophic. And I want to just give you two illustrations as to why it really is catastrophic in just a moment. So one of the great challenges is the climate emergency. And the, one of the problems about that is that because we've been to some extent familiar with the fact that it's happening, um, a lot of people glaze over when they hear mention of it. A lot of people feel impotent. They feel that they can't, as individuals, do anything. And so they kind of switch off and turn their backs on it and hope that somebody else will, I don't know, solve the problem or come up with some, some solution to it. And the result, of course, is that those agents in the world, governments and uh, multinationals, big corporations, who should be working together, because it isn't any single country, it's not any single multinational that can solve this problem, there really does need to be a concerted global endeavor. Indeed, the entire international community getting together on a war footing to try to make a massive switch to renewable energy resources and to think about how to mitigate and adapt to the um, problems that are already arising because of the warming, that that is something that they can defer. And the reason they defer it, of course, has to do with anxieties about losing competitive advantage against other economies and other uh, multinationals. Again, a point I'll come back to in a moment because it is a key, or one of the keys really, to thinking about this problem. So there's the climate emergency, uh, and it is astonishing to me and should be to anybody that it is just this week, this very week, that the United Nations have published a set of uh, suggestions about how we can try to mobilize and engage public opinion and public activity more uh, in, an, in an effort to try to get governments, and, and uh, especially the governments of the G20 and perhaps the principal polluters in the G7, really to do something about the difficulty. So we're doing this very, very late on. So I'll come back to that in a second. The second problem that, that I'd like to talk about is one which is m much, much less familiar than the climate problem. Indeed, in some respects, it is entirely unfamiliar, except in patches. And this is the fact that over recent decades, there has been an extraordinarily rapid development uh, in a whole 
palette of technologies which are, are having and are going to have a very, very big impact on us and on our world. We're familiar, of course, with the development of um, uh, artificial intelligence in so many of the systems that we engage with and which help to run our world, our banks, our, our energy suppliers, our aeroplanes, even indeed our motor cars, and certainly the phones in our pockets. All of them have AI in them, and um, their, their uh, efficacy is a tremendous boon, actually, to us in, in humanity in so many ways. But there are some aspects of what AI is or could be and is becoming that at least, at very least, prompts the need to do some thinking and discussing uh, of it. There are other technologies, gene editing technologies, brain chip interfacing technologies, which we have thought very little about. There's been no public conversation about how we are to manage the um, uh, uh, arrival of these technologies and the effect that they will have on us. Indeed, there's too little thought has been given to them altogether. And that is something which because we all think of them uh, in science fiction terms and we think of them as something that will happen in the future, uh, we do need to talk about because they are here already. We already live in the future without realizing it and we haven't had a proper uh, discussion of it. And finally, there is the source problem, both for the climate challenge and for the technology challenge, and that is the profound deficit in our world of justice and rights. The fact that the vast majority of people in our world, even indeed in what we think of as advanced liberal democracies around the world, have far too little say over what happens in their lives. That the disconnect um, between, for example, the fact that 70, 80% of people polled about climate uh, issues say, yes, something has got to be done, but the big disconnect between that number and what it is that their governments and, and their companies are doing about it shows that the public of the world, the people of the planet, are having far too little influence over what's actually happening in the planet. And this is the result of the fact that there is this terrific deficit in justice, in democracy, uh, and in rights enjoyed by the people of the planet. So I'll come back to that point again as well. So let me just speak just a little bit briefly about the climate matter. Again, as I say, to, to some extent um, there is familiarity, but that familiarity has bred a kind of willful indifference uh, in, in many people because of the sense of impotence uh, that we have about it. And I just want to illustrate it by talking about one sort of large-scale problem um, and one small-scale problem generated by the, the, the climate issue. The large-scale problem. Think of this. In recent years, we've seen large refugee movements from the Middle East, from the Syria conflict, for example, uh, and more recently from Ukraine, something like three million people displaced in, in Ukraine and fleeing the country and looking for a place of succor given the invasion by, by Russia. These are large movements. Millions of people, of course, present a problem to host communities welcome them and try to look after them, or don't welcome them and uh, have uh, policies which are inimical to people in search of safety and better conditions for themselves and their children. So we see these problems and we see the debates and tensions that arise about refugees uh, in our world today. It has always been, of course, the case with our um, world that uh, there have been push and pull factors with refugees. So people are pushed away from places of conflict of drought, of, of lack of opportunity, pulled by countries of wealth and safety and security, and they're thinking about a better life for their children. So there have always been these sorts of problems. But nothing, nothing in comparison to what will happen when sea levels rise and huge numbers of people, because vast, vast hundreds of millions of people live on seashores or in low-lying regions. The whole of Florida will be drowned. Bangladesh will be drowned. Most of the island communities you can think of, the Maldives and others in the Pacific, will be drowned. There are many, many cities, major cities, uh, uh, very low-lying cities, which will be affected by uh, sea level rises. They include, for example, Sydney and perhaps Melbourne itself, certainly London and others. Um, and when you think of what will happen when that occurs, and it's not just this, it's not just that 
as sea levels rise, so uh, high tides uh, are like kind of minor tsunami events, uh, perhaps running inland for many, many miles, salinating the soil, making agriculture impossible, um, making fresh water supplies difficult because they become brackish. It's not that kind of thing. That kind of thing is happening already. This is when tens of millions, perhaps hundreds of millions of people are displaced from littorals around the world and move into parts of, uh, of the world which are drier but may be already badly affected by uh, climatic conditions inimical there to agriculture and to um, uh, getting something as simple and necessary as fresh water, already stressed part of the world, into which these massive influxes of refugees come. Well, think of the tensions, think of the conflicts that arise, think of the extraordinary difficulties faced both by the migrant communities and by the, the uh, communities into which they go. This is a very, very real prospect. Uh, um, it's already happened, you may know, uh, for example, in the major flooding that happened in Bangladesh uh, about 20 odd years ago, when 20 million people were displaced temporarily it caused a huge stress, stress on the rest of Bangladesh and on uh, neighboring parts of India. But if that were permanent, think of the difficulty that just that one event would uh, cause, but think of it happening all around the world. And sea level rises uh, are, are on the way. The sea expands as the climate uh, warms up, and the Greenland and the Antarctic ice shelves are melting at a terrible rate now. You've seen probably satellite imagery of the, of the shrinking of the, of the um, uh, ice and snow around the world, not just in the North and South Pole, but also in uh, mountains, glaciers. So this is not a fear merely, it's an inevitability. That is why I talked about mitigation and adaptation, getting ready for the movement of huge numbers of people who are displaced by, by these events. So that's one, one problem. And it doesn't take very much imagination to see what difficulty there would be. But at the small scale, at the scale of individuals, think of this. In what is sometimes miscalled the global south, that is the developing poorer nations of the world, uh, in Africa, for example, and south, parts of South Asia, um, the immediate impact already of serious climate events, uh, severe weather events, and certainly the impact of uh, drought, wildfire, uh, terrible storms, floods, these sorts of events which are now much, much more frequent and much more devastating, they impact women in those societies far more than they do men. In almost all those societies, women don't learn to swim. In almost all of those societies, the clothing that women wear traditionally will drown them if they get caught in a flood. And they are the ones who look after children, the elderly, the, the sick, they are the ones who have to provide food for their families. They are the ones who have to get fresh water. If fresh water supplies are polluted or dried up or affected by landslides and, and floods or drought, they have to go further to look for fresh water. And therefore, they are more exposed to danger, to harassment and assault. So they are the ones who are absolutely at the coal face of the difficulties created by climate change. And very, very little thought is given to this fact. When we talk about adaptation and mitigation, you know, we're thinking in terms of um, uh, seawall defenses uh, or how to handle large uh, migrant populations and so on. But we don't think about what happens on the ground to people who have small children or elderly or relatives and so on, the women of the, of the global south who are going to be immediately impacted by, by these changes, indeed already are being impacted by them. So at the granular level, at the individual level, the, the uh, amount of human suffering and human difficulty is uh, almost unimaginable. But we need to imagine it because we need to understand that this is real, that the effects on human individuals are immediate and severe. So when one thinks in these terms, at the large level of hundreds of millions of people, at the granular level of, of individuals struggling, you can see that this is uh, an issue that it, with respect to which there really is no messing about. We cannot go on as we are going on at the moment, which is deferring, 
pushing things down the road, kicking it into touch a bit, hoping that there will be some technological fix, that we can sequester carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, um, that there will be some you know, miracle scientific solution. At this very moment, the need to try to uh, reduce the impact or prepare for the impact is beyond urgent. It's, it's already so late in the day that it's extraordinary when you think about um, the fact that governments and corporations are still talking and doing too little. Indeed, in the face of recent events of the COVID crisis around the world and of the uh, interdiction of energy supplies now as a result of the Ukraine problem in Europe, um, coal mines, coal mining, um, the exploitation of fossil fuel uh, resources, trying to extract more gas and oil uh, is, is happening as if there wasn't a climate emergency, as if instead of doing that, we could really shift resources into trying to increase our um, supplies of, of energy from renewables. You sometimes hear it said that uh, what we should do as a world is we should produce less and consume less. And that, in fact, is not the answer. Because if you consider that over the last three, four decades, something like a billion people in the planet have been lifted out of poverty, out of really dire poverty. Now, today, as we speak, there are about 500 million people in poverty, serious poverty, $2, $3 a day type of poverty. And that's, that's 500 million people, too many, obviously. But a about a billion people have been lifted out of poverty uh, over those last decades. And when you lift people out of poverty, of course, they consume more. And people who consume more, well, they, there is a requirement to produce more to satisfy their consumption demands. But, so instead of saying to the global south and the poorer and developing uh, countries, well, we in the rich parts of the world have got all our success and our economic uh, you know, uh, achievements. So you, who were still on the way to seeking them, you have to now consume less and produce less and stay poor so that the world, that is our comfortable rich part of the world, can survive. And the injustice of that is, is gross. And there's a very justifiable argument on the part of the developing countries that the burdens, as well as the benefits of anything which is done in this field, should be fairly distributed around the world. So instead of looking to reduce consumption and production, what we should do is we should shift to sustainable production and consumption. Don't consume less, just consume the kinds of things that won't do harm or more harm to the planet. And one great example of, of this is the following. You may know that a region annually, equivalent to 10 times the size of the county of Cornwall in England, is cut down in the Amazon rainforest to make room for grazing, for beef, source of protein. Well, it's been very well argued and well established that if we were to shift from eating beef to eating mealworms, and worms are a very, very uh, first-class source of protein, if we could eat worms instead of cows, we would be making a big contribution to the problem that we face in our planet. Now, when you put this point to most people, you see a certain, you know, kind of, it's a bit rhabarbic of thought, eat worms. And I say to them, look, either we move to eating worms in a kind of gourmet way, you know, hygienic and careful and thought out, or we will end up on our hands and knees looking for worms to eat when the planet has really collapsed around our ears. So you've got a choice. You're going to eat worms one of these days. Which way are you going to do it? And, and this is the kind of reality which p people don't face up to and they don't realize that we have to make serious choices of that kind in order to get the sustainability which is required. And of course, there are many, many other examples and one could iterate at the point uh, across the whole range. You think of these annual COP meetings like the one in Glasgow recently, the one coming up uh, very, very shortly, in which uh, world leaders fly from all around the world to a point in the world and meet and emit an enormous amount of hot air at the meeting itself. <laughs> and in their travels and in their discussions, of course, adding to the problem and then doing absolutely nothing about it afterwards. And why is so little done? Why is there so much foot dragging? Well, the answer is this. There is a law. I'm afraid it's a very bad law and it's a law which has to be broken if we're going to save ourselves in our world. And it's such a bad law that I've given it my name. It's called Grayling's Law. Uh, and it's a law of self-interest. And it has two aspects to it. 
First is, it states that anything that can be done will be done if it brings an advantage or a profit to whoever can get it done. So for example, uh, one of the things I'm just going to uh, talk about in a moment, gene editing, that is editing the genes of your you know, fetus to make a six foot five blonde blue eyed genius who can run the 100 meters in five seconds and so on. That is now technically feasible. The CRISPR technology, the editing of uh, fetal genes has already happened. You know that the man who did it in China to those twin girls has just been released from prison, having I mean, uh, been locked up for a couple of years as a result of doing it. But you know, even if you outlawed it, even if you outlawed gene editing of that kind, it will be done because those who can get it done will do it. This might be the very rich or some people. You know, the DARPA uh, Defense uh, um, Research Agency in the United States is trying to, to look at ways in which uh, uh, soldiers who need very little sleep, who are entirely, uh, you know, highly intelligent and who have a great deal of stamina and are fearless and so on, how you could gene edit fetuses to produce soldiers of that kind. They say that they think the Chinese, and it's always the Chinese, are doing it already. Uh, and it's technically possible uh, that, that this could be done. And you ask yourself the question, would anybody do it? And the answer is absolutely. If, if they could, you know, if it can be done, it will be done, even if you try to outlaw it, because there will be people who can get it done, the rich or the bad, or if it's different, um, the, you know, the, they, that will happen. So that's the, the one aspect of the law. And the other aspect of it is, things that can be done will not be done if they can be stopped by people to whom they bring a cost or a disadvantage. And the absolute classic example of this is Trump. Now, when he was uh, being campaigning to be elected uh, president of the United States, uh, he held up a sign, you may remember, on, on his uh, campaign saying, Trump digs coal. He was supported by the coal mining industry, voted for by coal miners, and so he, he said he was going to resile the US from the Paris Accords on, on climate action. Um, because he, he wanted to continue to extract and burn fossil fuels because he didn't want the US economy to be disadvantaged by having to invest in renewables uh, and, and not make use of its fossil resources. So there you have a perfect example. Something that can be done, that is we can take some kind of action to minimize the use of fossil fuels, but it won't be done if it can be stopped by anybody who feels that it brings them a cost. Now that law is a law of self-interest, and it's that law that has to be broken, campaigned against, understood clearly, and treated as a target of activism in order to get the major polluters, the major users of, of fossil fuels, to um, think instead about moving very, very fast uh, in the direction of renewables. So that's, uh, you know, the, of course, one could, uh, if we had breakfast organized for tomorrow morning, we could go on and on about the climate challenge, but I think, I think uh, uh, one can see that it is a very, very serious problem. Let us look now at the, t at the technology. So I've already mentioned that uh, it's not science fiction, that we can edit genes, and we can edit them in order to produce people that we want to produce. If you were reading Aldous Huxley's Brave New World in bed last night, you will remember that he says, there is a potential with, well, he was thinking in terms of eugenics, but now the technical feasibility of the CRISPR technology is that you could produce two subspecies of humans, the sort of aristocratic ones, the ones that are selectively bred to be superior, and then all the ones who are just the drones, who do the work and so on. This is the, the vision um, uh, considered in, in Brave New World, and it is now technically possible, and because it is, it's going to happen. There are going to be people who will be genetically engineered. The whole uh, um, you know, project of what's called transhumanism, which actually envisages the incorporation of, of uh, hard, you know, dry technology into the human body to enhance human beings. Well, of course, that in some sense, with hips and uh, um, you know, hearing aids and so on, has already been going on for a long time and, and will be developed further, obviously, but the gene uh, uh, editing of, of human beings, now a feasibility, a practicality, will almost certainly, on the basis of that law of self-interest, happen more and more, and it introduces uh, questions which we should at very least debate. How, well, do we want this to happen? Do we want to keep our bad teeth and our you know, short lifespans and so on? Or 
um, or not? And why would we want to? How would we manage it? How could we manage it in a way which is equitable across uh, humanity? Do we want to see emerge a sort of Aldous Huxley possibility? But nobody is discussing it yet properly, and yet it is something that should be discussed. That's one example. Here's another, brain chip interfacing. It's already happening. So, you know, to uh, introduce a chip into the brain which helps to control or, or helps with um, Parkinson's disease or epilepsy or traumatic memory or terrible depression. This is already practical and feasible and happening. But notice this, that if you could, could uh, introduce a chip into the brain and by its means help to control traumatic memories, then just drop the adjective traumatic. It can control memories. You might not want people to remember something that the government did. And if you had enough chips in enough people, you could efface that memory maybe or control it, maybe introduce a memory. It all sounds very spooky, sounds very science fiction, but it is not without the bounds of possibility and practicality right now. The same with mood, changing people's mood, being able to control it in some way. Well, this already happens, of course. Television news and, and um, the kind of uh, foods that people eat uh, already uh, have built into them ways of, of modifying and manipulating mood. Um, but brain chip technology would be a much more effective and direct way of doing it. And once again, Maybe we would all like to be cheerful all the time if the government were beaming something into our brain chips uh, to help us do it. Um, but at least we need to discuss it. Do we want it? And to what extent do we want it? How would it work? What effects would it have? What would we be like and our society be like uh, if this really became a thing? Because it is already a thing. Think about AI. So we, we would all rather have our brains operated on, if we needed to have them operated on, by an AI-controlled robot, which is incredibly precise and accurate in its every movement, and able to identify just those structures that need to be excised, and will do no damage to other parts of the brain, rather than your brain surgeon, who just uh, quarreled with her husband last night and she had too much to drink and her hand is shaking and so on. She said, give me the robot any day, okay? So we can see the advantages that AI can have in positive respects. And indeed, in many, many respects, of course, uh, the uh, AI systems already bring great advantages to us because, as I said earlier, they help uh, to manage many aspects of our lives. But think about this. Over the last several decades, there have been hundreds of millions of dollars invested in the development of what are called LAWS, L-A-W-S, which stands for Lethal Autonomous Weapons Systems, controlled not by people, not by human beings, not by military personnel, but by the AI programmed into them. Now, of course, you're all familiar with the drones that have flown over Afghanistan and, and uh, so on in recent conflicts there. And you know that they are flown by pilots in Nevada. The great advantage of them is the tremendous amount of weaponry they carry, the precision of those weapons and the cameras and so on. And the fact that uh, there's no body bag, bag problem because there's no human being on the uh, uh, unmanned aircraft, obviously by definition. So if one is shot down, um, well, the pilot is safely in the Nevada desert. Those uh, um, weapon systems, the drones, are called human in the loop systems because the human being is actually operating them. Already in service in the NATO navies, so US, UK, France, other NATO navies, there's the so-called Sea Whiz defense system, which is an anti-missile defense system on, on board uh, ships, which monitors the skies and if a hostile missile is coming towards the ship, it recognizes it and immediately responds and blows the missile out of the sky. Very similar to the Iron Dome defense system used by the Israeli Defense Force to defend against rockets coming in from Gaza. Completely automatic. But this system is monitored by somebody. So some human being is monitoring the activity of this system. Just in case it's your Virgin Australia holiday plane heading to Bali and it's off course, so you will be pleased to know that there is somebody on board that ship who says, OK, well, we won't blow this one out of the sky and we'll override what the system is about to do. So th those systems are known as human on the loop systems because even though they're automatic, there's a human being watching them. So human in the loop, human on the loop. 
But the law systems are called human out of the loop. There's no human being involved after they've been built and programmed and set going. Underwater, on the land, in the air, completely autonomous, equipped with AI, a meant to be able to identify enemy military assets and to deal with them. Now, a, a weapon system uh, you know, has to do three things, the three Fs, find, fix, and finish. So it's got to find the assets, it's got to identify them, and it's got to deal with them, uh, destroy them or disable them. And the AI has to be uh, competent to do that. Among other things, in the heat and tumult, dust and disturbance of battle, uh, a, a ground level uh, such system would have to be able to tell the difference between somebody surrendering and somebody about to throw a hand grenade at it. Or a civilian lost and stumbling, terrified through the smoke and, and uh, uh, tumult. Um, it's got to be able to do what we think of uh, now at the very minimum, what facial recognition technology, such as is used in Chinese cities and some places in India and in some many airports around the world. You know, the airports around the world have this facial uh, identification, trying to pick up people who might be terrorists. It's always puzzled me that because all of us in airports looking for our plane and everything look like terrorists probably, <laughs> but it's got to be able to, to, to distinguish those who really are from those who aren't. That means it's got to be able to read mood and intention and this would have to be the case with these systems uh, in operation. The great question is, could such systems accord with the humanitarian laws of war, uh, you know, uh, proportionality, discrimination between uh, military assets and non-military entities? Uh, who would be held accountable if they go wrong, if they blow up a children's hospital, let's say? Uh, who, who's, who's to blame, the government, the military, the manufacturer? These are big questions that, that need to be answered. The efficacy of these systems, their reliability in, in the heat of battle need to be thought about. And this is something which is already so far advanced that there may very well be such systems in operation already. There's an enormous amount uh, of uh, development has gone into them because you can see the advantage. None of your own personnel are at risk if it's machines that go out to do the fighting. And that's gonna change the nature of conflict it's going to raise a whole lot of questions about what such systems could do and be used to do. You can imagine what uh, Mr. Putin might think if he had enough systems of that kind to be used, wouldn't have to go for the nuclear option as he loses the war. You know, so you can see uh, that, that uh, there are serious questions to be asked about what we want to do with our technologies now that we have them and the potential they have is so great. So th these are just some examples, some small examples, and I do invite you, uh, if you would really, you know, if you haven't got a horror movie to watch on television, then go on the internet and look, look uh, uh, because it's all in the public domain, at DARPA, D-A-R-P-A, which is the d d uh, Defense um, uh, Department in the United States of America, the uh, official government defense agency research projects uh, th that they list on their website that they're looking into. A lot of, of what look like science fiction, you know, uh, options for the future of war uh, and the kind of technology that would be deployed in it and what they could do to enhance military personnel's capacity. And it is really f uh, alarming and at the same time interesting, of course, to see what it is they're coming up with. And you can bet your bottom dollar that if they're talking about these things as prospects, as research targets, that a great deal of it is already uh, subject to very, very heavy investment. Now, when I talked about the, the sort of Grayling's Law, what you notice about it is it's the way it is applied. It's applied as follows. No individual economy, no individual nation state is going to want to fall behind in the competition with others. So you might go to your government and say, don't develop these weapons. These weapon systems could really get out of control and do a huge amount of damage. This really alters the nature, the degree, the intensity of conflict. Don't do it. Well, the government, if they're honest, they're going to say, but uh, we agree with you. I mean, this is horrible. But if we don't have it, other people will have it. We've got to keep going in order to try to maintain some kind of 
uh, competitive equivalence with uh, uh, other agencies or be better than them. After all, if you look at the history of conflict, it's the people with the technology and the resources that win in the end, and so people are not going to want to fall behind. This is the reason why not enough is done on the climate challenge. Uh, uh, governments drag their feet a little bit because they don't want to you know, pay the cost of, of uh, uh, being at a disadvantage with other economies who don't drag their feet. In the weapons field, no major uh, weapons manufacturing country can risk, thinks that it can risk falling behind. This is why the nuclear weapons uh, problem remains in our world. So governments and, and big corporations also are thinking about their responsibility to their shareholders. You know, their bottom line is they have to make a profit. They've got to um, send out uh, dividends. And so they have to think about um, uh, that. Their major stakeholders are their shareholders, so they've got to think about how they serve them better rather than uh, you know, um, look at the effects, the longer-term effects of what their activity might bring in. And it, indeed, it's the case over the last 200 years that everything we can think of in terms of industry, in terms of conflict, right across the range, what, what's damaged our environment, what's put our human societies at risk and under stress, in, in competition and conflict, all come from this great motive, not to fall behind, not to allow others to gain an advantage over us. So who's doing that thinking? Well, is it the people on the planet? Is it, is it the voices of all in, in our world, concerned about uh, conflict, concerned about what's happening to our environment, concerned about their survivability, their communities? No, far too little Far too little influence is held uh, by, by we, the people of the planet, over those who make the decisions and do these things. And this is why, so now I come to the, uh, as it were, final chapter of this disquisition. This is why when we look for what a solution might be, and there is a solution, which I will say straight away is, po is possible, but unlikely, unfortunately, I think. I think nature is going to be taking our decisions for us, you know, on the worms front and so forth, as I said earlier. But uh, it, it is possible. And it is not what you think about dealing with the climate uh, challenge head on, which ne is necessary, dealing with the way our technologies in a whole menu of, of uh, ways are uh, raising serious questions that we should think about. But it's to some extent sort of you know, in the corner of the eye, off, off in left, left field. And to give you an example, uh, for, for a very long time I've been a representative at the United Nations uh, Human Rights Council for the uh, uh, Ethical uh, and Humanist uh, International Association. And back in the 1990s, a very important report was published by the UN on, on a day that I happened to be there in Geneva, and so I read it when it was fresh off the press, and I was absolutely bowled over by it, by, by the effect that it had on me, because this report was about the result of elementary education, just elementary education, enough to read, write, add, and subtract, on women in Africa. That if they could, if they had basic literacy and numeracy, it altered their lives dramatically. They tended to have fewer children. Their children tended to have higher educational attainment than themselves. They could, for example, own property rather than be property, you know, be the property of husbands and fathers. Um, and it gave them greater autonomy and control over their lives. And it was like a sort of magic dust in a way, a little bit of education, a magic dust. So I thought, oh, terrific. Uh, I'm going to found a school for girls in Africa somewhere, you know, just to be one little pixel, one little contribution to, to this. And no less a person than Ayaan Hersey Ali, whom you may have heard of, she was a you know, refugee who became an MP in the Netherlands, now lives in uh, North America. She said to me, under no circumstances should you start a school just for girls. It, should, it must be a co-educational school because the girls get such a lot of trouble from the boys and men in their community, so it must be co-educational. She said, if you are keen to um, contribute to a girls' education in Africa, the solution, the, really, the, the absolute key for that is to ensure that any school has a lavatory with a door. That is the solution to women, girls' education in Africa. Now, that would never have occurred to me in a million years, but as soon as she mentioned it, I saw why. 
which is that if girls can't look after their personal hygiene, when they reach puberty, they can't go to school. So a lavatory with a door is an essential. Now that's something so unexpected. And you, say, you think, oh, you know, that little key, that little pinch point factor is transformative. Well, we did, uh, we have a little school in Sierra Leone, very small out in the rural area. Now I have taught and graduated hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of university uh, undergraduates and master's students and PhD students and so on. But the two of whom I'm most proud are the first two people we graduated from that little school in Africa. Just think. Now, well, <laughs> uh, in fact, the, the prime mover of that school is the, is the writer Aminata Fauna, who is herself from, from Sierra Leone. And it is really thanks to her knowledge of the country and so on that that was made possible. But uh, it, was, it was a marvelous moment to, to hear about that uh, because recognizing you know, the left field solution uh, what, what was the important factor in a way. But what is the left field solution for us? Well, you can sum it up in, in one word, although in fact it's a, it's a complicated story because of course it's, it's a too big a word and too complex a word for people to understand immediately what we mean. But the one word solution is democracy. And by it I mean citizen democracy. Uh, the, the, the possibility of, of uh, citizenries to be, if they could be, well-informed and uh, um, collectively motivated to have an impact on what their governments do so that their governments will act in their interests instead of thinking that, that governments govern people, that they serve their people. And that to serve their people means, since our world is an indivisible entity, that they have to work with other governments in the interests of all the people of the planet. So here is the slightly utopian idea that if what, what uh, the people of our planet can be um, helped to understand and recognize and then can be encouraged to work together to have that kind of influence through means of, of deliberative democracy, citizens' assemblies, genuinely proportional representation in uh, the formation of legislatures, and therefore having you know, a, a sensible grown-up uh, impact on what uh, individual governments do, in the case of this happening to all individual governments, then those individual governments would work together, even if it was just the governments of the G20 or even just the G7, because they could have an enormous impact on what happens on the climate matter and on the technology matter, trying to find ways of uh, making good use of our uh, technological expertise now and thinking seriously about potential malign uses of them. Then, then we could make a difference in our world. But as I said earlier, it's possible that could happen if people woke up uh, and did this, but it's unlikely, unfortunately. The great problem, of course, is motivating people and informing people and getting them to, to do this thing, which is to think seriously about the problem and, and to take action. Personally, I have a great deal of admiration for, for those activists. You know, people like Greta Thunberg, who is a marvelous individual. Uh, I'm, I'm an admirer. I know a lot of people are not of uh, Extinction Rebellion. I think they do. The fact that they really alert people to the serious emergency we're facing, and they do it by direct action, is, is something to honor, because they, they really do uh, feel the, the pressure of the problem. But it would be so much better if we collectively, we the people of the planet, and especially the people of the more advanced economies, were to sit up and act in sensible and productive ways, but quickly, not, we can't leave this, we can't hope that it's gonna be five or 10 years for a solution, we should be doing it now. Uh, and by the way, go online, look at the UN guide uh, that just published this week on how individuals and communities and citizens groups can have an impact uh, and uh, put that to work, make it happen. Those of you who are here tonight, of course, don't need to be persuaded. You are, you know, I'm singing to the choir here. So it's the people you encounter in the supermarket, in the street, in your workplaces, in the pub, uh, to whom if one could capture at least one other person or a couple of other people in the course of talking to them about these matters, in informing and alerting them, that little pixels of contribution can be added to the overall picture that needs to be drawn about what we do in our world. And every little such pixel will, will help. We may think that the, the, um, the, the trends, both 
in climate warming, in the development and application of technologies are beyond not just our individual potential, but even beyond our communities, even beyond our, our nation state. We may think that. But to think it is very defeatist. To think it is to give up too soon. Uh, as as our, our acting Lord Mayor has said quite rightly, hope must never be given up. We've got to keep uh, trying to, to the very, very last minute. We've got to keep trying. And part of that is informing and motivating. People can't be motivated to act unless they are informed. Informing people and getting them to be moved by the information is the, the serious point. And I'll end on, a, uh, on, on an example of how that might happen. But by the way, you may remember, um, well, some of you may remember when Adlai Stevenson was uh, a um, contender for the presidency in the United States. He stood against Eisenhower back in the early 50s very intellectual man, a very thoughtful man. And somebody said to him, Mr. Stevenson, every thinking person in America is going to vote for you. And he said, I'm pleased to hear it, but I need a majority. Well, <laughs> this is the great, the, 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 the great problem in our world is getting people to think, getting people to understand. And getting people to think, moving them to, to you know, really understand uh, involves jolting them into doing so. So I want to give you an example of, of, of how, if you can, if you can construct the narrative or you can find a way of, of presenting this to people, it, it can be helped. So, so this is the example. A few years ago, I had the very great privilege of being invited by the government of Chile to go to Santiago and take part in a conference there. And the inducement that they offered was a weekend in the Antarctic. Now, who's going to turn down that opportunity? So I went to the Antarctic. If you've ever stood in a field of snow, you've been in the Antarctic, okay. But anyway, so I was there in the Antarctic with a uh, a, a really, really interesting individual, sadly no longer with us, a man called Arjen Hoekstra, who is a, a leading um, thinker and, and activist in the, uh, he was a professor of hydrology at Twente University in the Netherlands. And he asked me a question, we were on a boat, uh, on, a, on a Chilean warship, the captain of which had said to us, we're going to have to move very slowly among these ice flows here because this boat is not constructed for uh, Antarctic waters. So if we hit one of these ice flows, we're going to sink. And by the way, we've been told a little before that you've got about five seconds in the Arctic water to survive. So we were all very apprehensive. Anyway, uh, so th th this individual said to me, ask me a question. He said, what percentage of fresh water consumed in the United Kingdom is imported? And I thought, that's a really odd question. That, does he mean in the form of uh, I don't know, bottled mineral water or something. In fact, when I asked this question of my own students later, one of them said, well, 100% because it comes in the clouds. But that's not what he meant. So I said, well, well uh, I don't know how to answer that because I don't quite know, you know how to kind of conceptualize it. And he said, the answer is this. 70% of the fresh water consumed in the United Kingdom by the citizens of the United Kingdom is imported into the country from outside the country in the form of fresh fruit and vegetables grown in countries, hot countries like Morocco and Spain and other, with water shortages and flown overnight into the UK to be fresh in the supermarket the next day. I suddenly thought, how many levels of insanity is that? To import fresh water um, taking it from countries where they don't have enough water and flying it in. I mean, think of it. I mean, that, that is just, it's just a kind of madness the way we organize things in our world in complete, you know, disregard of the effect on the environment and the fact that people just don't know it. If people walk into a supermarket in London or Manchester or anywhere and they see some nice tomatoes and oranges and buy it, do they think? that this is mainly water, you know, 90% water. Where did the water come from? And have they got enough water where they grew this? And did they really fly this here yesterday so that I could buy it today? No, people don't think about it. And therefore, to get people to think. You remember what Bertrand Russell said, most people would rather die than think, and most people do, and that's the world's <laughs> tragedy. So to get people to think is the very, very first step in motivating the people of the planet to rise up and do something about the difficulties that we face, because there is no alternative. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Anthony, and, and thank you all uh, for that. I am stunned by that last anecdote, and I certainly will not walk into the supermarket and think about anything the same ever again. Thank you. Um, I will ask a couple of questions now to give you all a moment to see if there's something that you'd like to ask AC Grayling after that um, such an expansive and uh, thought-provoking pro talk. So I'll, I'll get us started. I know that as th you hold so many roles, but as an ethicist for the UN, you're so used to pulling together these um, these these kind of wide perspectives. You, you're pulling together so many different topics. Why did these two topics come together for you uh, as the inspiration for this book? Well, I think because each of them is uh, so salient as a problem in our world today. I mean, I don't think anybody can dispute the fact that the climate uh, challenge uh, is, a, is an imminent danger. I mean, it really is an emergency now. And we've talked about this and talked about this. It's been known, you know, for since the 1820s that carbon uh, uh, dioxide equivalent emissions into the atmosphere would have this effect over the long term. Uh, been understood for a long time. The idea of the greenhouse effect was clearly identified and understood, even within the fossil fuel industries, as far back as the 1960s and 70s, and nothing is done, nothing is done. Extraordinarily, uh, the great, um, the first big real international climate conference, which was Kyoto in 1997, I, I was actually there on the day, and there they all were, Al Gore was there from the US, they were all talking about the damage to the climate, and the air, over Kyoto was full of helicopters all day long, you know, just polluting and polluting. And so it was double pollution, all the talk as well. And, and the amount of uh, the, the um, percentage of, of emissions uh, doubled after Kyoto. I mean, it's extraordinary that it just kept on being, getting worse and worse and worse. So uh, it's now beyond, beyond an emergency. And, and we're, we're, you know, just think about the wildfires, think about the floods, the droughts. Think about the fact that every year, all the plant and animal species on our planet, and very many of them are now under serious threat, including ourselves, but all, all plant and animal species are having to migrate a kilometer a year towards the North Pole if they're in the Northern Hemisphere, towards the South Pole if they're in the Southern Hemisphere, in order to be in the same ecological niche, the same climate conditions for which they are adapted. As the, uh, as the tropics become um, you know, more severely affected by drought and flood and wildfire, so they become you know, less and less habitable, certainly less and less uh, uh, cultivable, we're thinking about the fact that tropical diseases will be suffered by people in Scotland and Iceland and Greenland, you know, within, um, before the end of this century, as mosquitoes, rats, other, you know, uh, entities become more habituated to the warmer parts of the world. You know, it really is a disaster that's unfolding right under our noses now, and therefore people have to wake up. So that's one. Technology. You know, everybody in this room has embraced technology with enthusiasm. Everybody in this room has got a phone in their pocket, a device. Now, with more computing power, as we all know, than the chaps who went to the moon back in 1969. Uh, amazing, we love it. And you all think you didn't pay a penny piece, you know, not a single cent for your email, your WhatsApp, your TikTok, your whatever you have. You think it's all free, don't. You pay for it every time you open that device. You pay with your personal information. And masses of, of personal information are being analyzed, big data, uh, profiling of individuals and groups being used by advertisers, political parties. You know, we, we've sold our, our privacy. We've stripped ourselves naked to the view of any public or private agency that wants to, to have a look at us. Uh, and, and we have, uh, and therefore, the, you know, the world has changed in, in that kind of respect. And that's just one example. It needn't be a malevolent or malign example, uh, but it could be, of course. I think the Trump election and the Brexit referendum were examples of uh, manipulation of that kind of data. But uh, you could see ways in which the benefits could be uh, counterbalanced or even outweighed by some of the disbenefits that will result from the enormous control that 
knowledge and of how to work those technologies could have on the populations of the world. So these two problems that just stick out as, as serious issues for us to think about, talk about, and do something about. I mean, there are certainly other problems. But those and are move as well. Yes. I wanted to move to the concept of, of global cooperation. Um, I know that the Brexit topic is one that you're very passionate about and, and that you're involved in trying to unpick the UK from that um, referendum. How has that shaped your view of multinational agreement? Well, you know, the, the um, European Union ha has, well, for all its flaws and difficulties, it's a, it's a work in progress, it needs reform, it needs a lot of development. But for all, all that, it is a marvellous, in its way, magnificent example of what can happen when a group of nations come together and say, after hundred years of, hundreds of years of conflict and division and the dreadful things that happened in the First and Second World Wars, no more. We're going to work together. This is a great project for peace, for progress, for sharing, for cooperation. And it has been a model, actually, think about it, ASEAN, uh, um, the uh, African nations, the South American nations, all trying to re replicate some aspects of the EU. The need for international cooperation, mainly, of course, in the case of those other bodies, they're about economic cooperation only, but, but you know, human progress, progress on human rights, progress on participation of populations in the political process, all those things are front and center in the EU example. Uh, and, and the world is no longer it, 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 it's just no longer a, a place for nationalism and, and division and separation and conflict. You know, it's no longer a place for uh, irredentism of the kind that we see in Putin and in uh, China. It's, it's a place for international comity, people getting together, working together, not necessarily overriding national identities or local cultures. I mean, the EU certainly hasn't defaced the difference between the French and the Germans and the Italians and so on, those cultures still flourish uh, terrifically, and yet they're able to work together. Back in the 18th century, Tom Paine said, if you want to stop war between countries, make them so uh, intimately connected to one another through trade that they cannot go to war with one another without tremendous damage to their economies. The same was said by Cobden and Bright, the famous free traders of the 19th century. And this was the realization of the founders of the EU who said, if we, can, if we can implicate, in the literal sense of that term, the economies of uh, the European nations, we will perforce have to cooperate and, and we won't fall out with one another and, and go to war with one another. And this is how, this is how humanity must think. And we've, that, that has to be our future because uh, the alternative, which is to go back to the pre, you know, back to the 19th century and before idea of militarism and you know, international conflict and so on, is not an option for us. Now, we do have the opportunity for audience questions. There are uh, Wheeler Centre uh, microphone holders. It, do we have any questions? Please just pop your hands up and we'll be able to ask them. Questions, comments, or complaints, there's, by the way. Many of those uh, will be. There's a question there. I think there's a mic moving right towards you from the back of the room. Um, thank you very much for that interesting talk. Um, you, of course, rightly identified that we're not making progress on climate change as well as we might because of national self-interest. Um, if we extrapolate that through to accepting that self-interest is embedded in all of us as individuals from an evolutionary biology point of view, is the problem we face not almost intractable? And can you give an example of where we have come together to solve a problem as the human race where profit was not involved? Okay, well, that's an interesting question and, and a, a complicated answer coming up. It's just, you know, typical philosophical answer, yes and no kind of answer, um, which is that uh, you're right that um, self-interest and, and individualism and, and particularly interest in our own close kin and our own tribe and our own locality tends to weigh a great deal with us. But we are, we human beings are actually a social species and um, we have very natural and evolved proclivities 
to sympathize with and, and to act in the interests of others, even remote others, people outside our immediate kinship groups, once we have some understanding and some connection with them. The example that one might cite in this is, do you remember the YouTube thing about that basketball player in America a couple of years ago who was hit on the side of the head by a basketball and one of his eyes popped out and dangled on his cheek at the end of his optic nerve? Now, when I cite this, you hear a murmur of horror in the audience because they sympathize with what happened. In fact, what went viral on YouTube was not the eye popping out, but people looking at, it, at the YouTube um, image of the eye popping out, and, and practically everybody was going, oh, God, you know, what a horrible thing to happen. We yawn when others yawn, we laugh or smile when we see others laughing and smiling. We feel um, sympathy or you know, a revulsion when we see other people in pain. And so if we're exposed to how things are with others, including people on the other side of the planet, it provides us with some motivation. Because after all, we all know that very, very few members of our species like to be hungry or cold or in pain or alone or imprisoned and, and so on. And those who do like those things are weird. So we, we have some sense of, of uh, you know, how things are with others. And that can be a motivation for, for us to do something about it when we're informed. The philosophers among you will notice that this is a repudiation of Hume's claim that a descriptive understanding of anything is never a ground for how we act. I, I just deny that. I think it is a ground for how we act. And this is why information and, uh, you know, perceiving the effects of climate change or, or of conflict uh, on other people is necessary. We have to inform ourselves because it is a motivation to act. Thank you. We have time for one more question, I'm told. So who wants to be the lucky last asker? Here we are. I'm here, um, I'm curious to hear you expand on the solution you touched on, which you said was greater citizen participation in democracy and a truly representational government. But you then went on to talk about the challenges of Brexit, which of course was decided by popular vote. And it's quite instructive in, you know, we've seen with the election of Trump too, that often putting things to a popular vote doesn't necessarily result in a better policy outcome depending on your politics. The challenges that you've talked about tonight generally, I think, rely upon a level of technical expertise. You could say that about uh, issues with AI, you could say that about solving climate change. I really would like to hear you expand on how you could at the same time suggest that a truly representational citizen involved level of democracy would not produce the outcomes we've seen in populism in the last couple of years, particularly for the very technical challenges you've touched upon. Right. May, may I say first uh, about the Brexit uh, vote that in the referendum in 2016, it was 37% of the total electorate, which was a restricted electorate. It was a general election electorate, not a referendum electorate, because a number of, of interested groups were excluded from the vote but it was 37% of that total electorate that voted leave, 37%, so just over a third. On the day of the vote, that 37% translated into 51.89%. You can see how I've lived with this nightmare pretty intimately. 51.89% <laughs> of actual votes, votes cast on the day. And there were a number of reasons why this is so. Firstly, um, that 37% <clears throat> was very, very varied in its motivation. For, for voting leave. And not all of them expected that there would be a, 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 a leave result. A lot of the people who didn't vote, didn't vote because they thought that nobody would be stupid enough to vote to leave the EU. The referendum was advisory. Uh, in, in one of the court actions that followed, and we, we were party to some uh, attempts at law to overturn the result of the referendum because the Leave campaign said overspent and been in violation of electoral law. And the court said that had it been a mand mandatory um, referendum, it would have to be voided because of the illegalities. But uh, because it was advisory only, it couldn't be voided. So the government of the day, a conservative government, decided to take the advice of just over a third of the total but restricted electorate to leave the EU. 
despite all the prognostications about the effects that would happen, I'm afraid to say that the Remain campaign, of which I was a very, very enthusiastic uh, participant, uh, did not do a good job. You know, we just concentrated on the economic consequences. It's turned out, by the way, that we were wrong about the economic consequences, because in fact things are much worse than we thought they would be, <laughs> and already proved to be so. So n now, now, if you look at polling data, um, about 60% of the electorate, of the GE electorate, is now in favor of rejoining, and about 23% still want to stay out. So, uh, you know, people have woken up to the fact that a horrible mistake was made. And this is a very good illustration of how, in a, in a, uh, um, in a situation such as we have in the UK, we don't have a codified constitution. So all the referenda which have been held since 1972, the first one was on uh, Irish uh, reunification, 1972, all of them have been held on a different basis. One of them has been mandatory, all the others were advisory. Some of them had thresholds minimum 40% vote or a supermajority 66% requirement. In the case of the Brexit vote, there was no threshold. And in fact, on the 16th, now uh, you've got a real nerd here, <laughs> on the 16th of June 2015, the then minister for the um, EU in the uh, British House of Commons said there was no need to put a threshold into the referendum bill because it was only advisory. It takes a minimum 40% vote of the entire membership of a trades union in the UK for a strike to be legal. It takes 66% of all sitting members of the House of Commons to agree to a dissolution and an election uh, outside the terms of the parliamentary period in order for there to be a general election. So thresholds and supermajorities but a 37% vote for uh, leaving the EU, a massive constitutional change with horrendous effects on, on, on the country, uh, and, it, and it went through. Now there is an example of uh, information of having the right structures in place of doing things in a properly democratic way. A properly proportional system of elections and, and referenda would have a different outcome. Now, let me give you an example. In the Netherlands last year, there was an election in the uh, North, uh, Northern Hemisphere spring, so March, April, there was an election, general election, and because, because the voting system is very proportional and there are many political parties, it took the Netherlands until December last year to form a government. Now, most people think, oh, horrors, you know, that's terrible. I think that's a marvelous example of democracy at work because the great diversity of interests and needs and desires and, uh, and preferences in the population is respected by the fact that there is a great range of representation in the legislature and that people sent to represent those uh, viewpoints need to get together, discuss and come up with a set of public policy uh, initiatives which really serve the interests of all. Or, or, or of the you know, sort of genuine overall interest of the country, and not a partisan interest, not those who voted for you only or your party political donors, but there has to be a range of uh, measures which reflect this wider um, uh, menu. And that's because no society has a natural majority in it for anything. All societies are, are great collections of minorities and individuals. Some minorities come together to form a temporary majority at election time because they are offered a, a manifesto by the major political parties. You know, and it's an uncomfortable thing, isn't it? You think some policies are okay, you don't really agree with others, but you know, you would vote for that party even if it was a donkey with the rosette, you know, because of your habits of voting. And, and this is what happens in unrepresentative systems, such as we have in the US, Canada, the UK, India. They're all plurality voting systems. Boris Johnson, of malign memory, um, <laughs> was, was elected to the House of Commons with an 80-seat majority over the rest of all the other parties on 43% of votes cast, representing 29% of the electorate. That's not democracy by a pretty long chalk, I don't think. And that is why the real needs and interests of a very diverse population, a very diverse world, are just not getting through to the people who make the decisions. And that's my argument about why we need, you know, we need, it sounds sort of utopian, but we need real democracy. But real democracy requires information, participation, 
uh, it, it requires us all to, to motivate and bring in other people who would rather, you know, because they've got their careers, families, uh, other concerns, they, they don't want to be thinking about politics all the time. But on these big issues, we've got to drag them in and say to them, look, we, each of us, all of us, we have a stake in this, and, and we've got to get together and do something sensible. Thank you, um, Anthony. I I don't know about you, but I've certainly been thinking about the rise of the uh, climate independence in our most recent election, and perhaps the Australian public has, you know, more uh, in agreement with this book than we may think. I really want to thank you for everything tonight. It's such a pleasure to encounter such a vast intellect, so much warmth, and such clarity for what we need to do next. Thank you all, and thank you, Anthony.